Peter sat at the kitchen table and smoked one cigarette after another through the open window. It was frosty, but the cold coming into the apartment from the street did not bother the man. He was in such a state that such trifles did not bother him now. Outside the window came a gray, dull dawn. The meeting with the notary would be at 11 o'clock in the morning, and there was still plenty of time. Sarah Lanina was sleeping sweetly in her bedroom, wrapped in warm blankets. Unlike Rethegg, she's clearly happy about the whole situation, and it's strangely repulsive. And just a couple months ago, Peter had considered this girl to be the ideal. She was beautiful, decisive, ambitious, intelligent. When necessary, jokes appropriately. When necessary, will put a man in his place. And most importantly, tender and loving, a real woman. Next to such men feel strong, necessary. Not like Barbara. Peter's heart ached again because she was his wife. She was not a stranger to him. Despite the presence of Sagalinina, despite everything that had happened recently, Barbara remained for him a queen. They had met while they were still students. The girl was conquering the faculty of finance and economics Peter studied at the law school. No, the guy never particularly dreamed of becoming a lawyer. Since childhood, he read a lot. He especially liked stories about relationships, love, passion, hatred, fear. It was interesting to unravel the intentions of the characters, to speculate about why they act in this or that way. No wonder that his essays on literature were the most profound and interesting. The teacher even read out some fragments in front of the class. He also drew a lot. His desk drawer was full of albums with all kinds of drawings. There were fantastic creatures, courageous warriors, and just unusual ornaments. Drawing was soothing, peaceful, and time-consuming. Peter himself did not understand how it happened he seemed to sit down at the table to do algebra, distracted for a minute to finish drawing another character, and everything falls out of reality he comes to his senses and only then realizes with surprise that he spent several hours drawing. The boy was clearly a creative person, but his parents were not satisfied with this. Mother and father seemed to agree on only one thing. They both felt that their son needed a serious profession. And, well, the father had some connections, so Peter ended up at a prestigious law school. True, the study did not cause the slightest interest, but parents argued that you need to study, otherwise you will not achieve anything in life, and Peter used to believe his parents and obey them. But at university, he met Barbara. Peter noticed her in his first year. She had such an interesting appearance. She wasn't beautiful, no, but there was something aristocratic in the girl's appearance, not for nothing she was called Queen Barbara. Snow-white skin, beautiful intelligent eyes of a dark shade of black shiny hair, always smoothly styled, clear cheekbones, nose with a slight hunch and a confident line of lips, and most importantly regal posture and sharp, but still surprisingly graceful movements. Later Peter learned that the girl as a child attended a ballet studio, which she hated with all her soul. Parents insisted that the girl must move beautifully, and the guy understood her very much. His parents also knew what was best for him. She was constantly busy doing something. She didn't just look like a businesswoman, she was one, participated in some contests and conferences from the university, worked part-time. Peter didn't know how he got so much information about this girl. She did not notice him at all, did not even know about the existence of such a modest, quiet guy. But Peter was in love with her. He then attracted a completely different type of girl, but for some reason he did not let her out of his sight. Peter was in his fourth year of college. It was summer weather. The middle of May, the time of credits, the time to get admission to the session. The boy went out for a walk to the ice cream stand. Since morning, he had been studying thick notebooks with notes, preparing for tomorrow's test, and decided to take a break. He was about to round the corner of the neighboring house when he heard a growl behind him and a startled exhale from somewhere far away. That sound was what made Retag turn around. He hadn't expected to see such a thing Barbara Previously, the guy had only seen her in the walls of the university. Peter knew that the girl lived somewhere in the center, rented an apartment, since she was not local. From somewhere either from a village or from a regional town. And here she was, right next to his house. Strange. But there was no opportunity to ponder it for long. Growling and crouching to the ground, two large dogs approached the girl. There were a lot of dogs here lately. There was a construction site nearby, so the animals lived somewhere behind the fence. The builders fed them at first, but then the construction stopped. Temporarily or permanently, he didn't know. Now, hungry packs were roaming the neighborhood. There were attacks on people. Now two dogs were attacking their prey. 
The girl noticed the boy's look, and so much hope was in her eyes that he, always a bit cowardly and indecisive, simply could not act otherwise. Grabbing a large boulder from the ground, he headed straight for the dogs. The boy thought that if the dogs came at him, at least one of them would be able to hit him over the head him over the head with the rock. Maybe even stun the beast for a while. But what to do afterward? There's still a second dog here. There was no time to think about it. Just like that, he had become a hero. The guy approached the girl and asked, trying to make his voice sound firm, not shaking. Are you okay? They didn't do anything to you. No, the girl shook her head, looking at her savior with gratitude. Thank you very much. I was confused. The girl was transforming before her eyes from a confused and frightened, fragile victim into herself, into a queen. Her acquired firmness and her movements and voice confidence. Yes, we have hungry dogs running around, attacking many. Pity them, on the one hand. In the end, it's all our fault, humans, she sighed. Listen, weren't you in a hurry? No, Peter answered honestly. Then can I ask you a favor? Walk me, please, because I'm confused here, and I'm afraid to run into dogs again, to be honest. Will you walk me? The boy felt like a real hero. Queen Barbara herself is counting on him. Wow! Of course I will. The guy took her the long way on purpose, though he could have taken a shortcut through the courtyards. It was just nice to walk and talk to her like that. The girl turned out to be a wonderful conversationalist, intelligent, attentive, understanding. It turned out that they liked the same books. Who would have thought it? But no matter how he looped around, eventually the street grew in front of the two companions. Well, here we are. Thanks again. I'm here to see a classmate. We agreed to study for our midterms together. I study at a state university. I know he smiled, pleased with the effect of his confession. Barbara was surprised. How do you know? I study there too in law school. I've just seen you many times, that's all. By the way, I have a test tomorrow too. What a small world. Well, since we're at the same university, we'll see each other again. The girl smiled charmingly and disappeared down the driveway. That day, the boy could not think of anything but the deep, dark eyes of the queen. It was good that at least he was almost ready for the test. He had never felt any romantic feelings for this girl before, though he knew her, saw her, kept her in his sight. And now, when they talked to each other, it was as if she had conjured him up. It was her pleasant, literate speech, respectful attitude, unexpected weakness, fear of stray dogs. The girl was now attracted to him like a magnet. The guy hoped that they would see each other at the university the very next day. And so they did. Not entirely by chance, though. Peter deliberately went to the floor where the economist had a test. As if by accident, he passed by the classroom, near which students were jostling, and saw Barbara. She also noticed him, nodded to the guy, and even hurried to meet him. At first they were just friends, talking and walking together a lot. Even went to the movies for movies they both looked forward to. Fortunately, their taste was specific, so they went to such sessions only the two of them, without extra eyes and ears. The boy admired Barbara, enjoyed her closeness. He really wanted to take her hand, maybe even kiss her, but she acted like a friend, like a buddy, and the guy was afraid of spoiling everything, so he didn't show his feelings. It was better to stay friends than to feel awkward every time they met. He didn't want to ruin the warm buddy relationship that had already emerged. And then they found themselves at a common student party, a disco in honor of the end of the next academic year. Fifth year ahead, graduation. Almost the whole road to higher education is behind them, something to celebrate. Peter watched Barbara dancing with the other guys and was wildly jealous. No, the girl didn't owe him anything. They weren't even considered a couple. Peter himself was also free to dance with whoever he wanted, but these guys hugging each other in a dance with her. They caused fury and rage, an unpleasant feeling of storm, but he did not show his face he joked and laughed with his friends, even participated in stupid contests. And then, already late in the evening when everything was over, the girl herself came up to him. The guy noticed that the girl was not quite sober. Officially strong drinks were forbidden at this party. But of course they were in fact present here. Don't you like me at all? Barbara asked in a stunningly direct tone. Of course you do. Peter clapped his eyes together in confusion. He hadn't expected to hear such a thing. I mean, as a girl, she explained, I'm not pretty, 
My nose is hunchbacked. My lips are thin. I'm tall. Too skinny. No shape whatsoever. Do you like other girls? And she was almost right. A few months ago, the guy really liked other girls. Girls of so-called model looks. But now there was no one prettier and more attractive than him. Probably now was the right moment to tell about it, but for some reason the right words could not be found. But the girl was very talkative. Didn't you notice how I feel about you? We are so much in touch and all this time I'm waiting for a sign from you. Something that would allow me to think that you also like me. But you only see me as a friend, don't you? And now I've ruined everything. Peter shook his head negatively, staring at the girl. So be it. I'll finally tell you what I think. I'm in love with you. Can you believe it? I always thought I liked more masculine, more brutal guys, like athletes. I tried to hang out with this basketball player, and he was dumb. He's a pussy, and all the other guys I hung out with were dumb, and you're not. You're different. Smart. Understanding real, Peter smiled. He was pleased to hear her say that. He didn't know what to say in response, so he just hugged her to him. The girl put her head on his shoulder and continued her monologue. I danced with them all today, just because of you, just to make you jealous. But you remained indifferent. It hurts so much. You don't understand anything, Peter sighed. You're as stupid as I am. What do you mean? The girl pulled away and looked into his eyes with interest. And then he did what he had dreamed of doing for so long he kissed the girl. They started dating. Quiet, modest student of law school and bright, successful queen so different in temperament and character but still very similar in many ways. They had so many common interesting topics for conversation, so many joint activities that both liked. They really turned out to be like two halves of one whole. It was the girl who helped the guy to decide what he really wanted to do in life. You are a born psychologist, she once said, subtly feel people, interested in the feelings and thoughts of others. Try it, take a course. Maybe you'll get something. And Peter obeyed. After graduation, he got a job in a law office, did boring, routine work, received pennies, and at the same time studied online psychologist. Now that was something he really enjoyed and was actually passionate about. I told you, Barbara smiled smugly. I'm almost never wrong. The girl herself, meanwhile, was actively building her own business. She already owned an attire. Peter supported Barbara in everything. And she, accordingly, supported him. She developed the attire and the guy tried himself as a psychologist, began to counsel people. They lived together in a rented apartment. They didn't talk about marriage, but this event in the future was implied as if by itself. And then, as if out of the blue, the girl's business trip abroad. She had an opportunity to study at a prestigious business school, but it meant a long separation. It's such a chance you have no idea. With eyes burning with admiration, she shared her impressions. The guy, of course, rejoiced for his beloved, but he was also anxious. After all, this is not a matter of one month or even half a year. Barbara will have to spend about two years abroad. How would that affect their relationship? Somehow he thought that she would find someone there and would not want to go back at all, but he was wrong. The relationship really didn't stand the test of distance, but the fault in this was not Barbara. The first time after the departure of his beloved, he was not himself, he missed her so much. Peter missed her desperately from the moment he left her at the airport. He did everything on autopilot, working in his law office, counseling clients as a psychologist. They socialized, of course, almost every night. Barbara looked tired, but happy, enthusiastic. She liked everything teachers, practical classes, even hours-long lectures. The girl shared her impressions with her boyfriend. As usual, he spoke encouraging words to her, supported her. As time went on, the video sessions became more and more infrequent. The course was intense. Sometimes she just didn't have the time or energy to talk to her boyfriend. He, of course, was getting himself worked up. It seemed to him that Barbara had someone else for their conversations were too superficial, infrequent and short. Being a psychologist, he realized that it was because of his complexes. The mistrust and fear of losing her were all the result of insecurity. It seemed to re-tag that there were many young men around who were both prettier and more successful than him. Of course, Barbara compared and perhaps thought about starting a relationship with someone else, someone more worthy. When Barbara was around, he saw her eyes full of tenderness and acceptance, felt her warmth and sympathy. But now she is far away, and Retag began to think that Barbara does not love him at all, that she is worthy of more, that he does not reach her level. 
she is a successful beauty who has already established her own business. While she is studying abroad, the business is run by the manager, a classmate of the girl, the same friend who was attacked by dogs on the way to her house. And he is just an out-of-state lawyer with a paltry salary and an aspiring psychologist. It remains to be seen whether he will succeed in any of these fields. At this very moment, Julia appeared in his life a girl who had recently broken up with a young man and now felt broken and depressed, so she turned to a psychologist. He counseled in online mode. His clients were from different cities, but it just so happened that Julia was his neighbor, who lived literally two blocks away. Peter realized this when he saw the view outside the window behind the beautiful girl on the screen. Huge, anxious eyes of an amazing violet hue, long brown hair, cute and very pleasant facial features. Julia was so touching, so soft and feminine. She was not at all like Barbara, who was confidently rushing toward her goal and was used to sweeping away all obstacles in her way. She was four years younger than Retag and still in her third year of university. For about six years, that is, since high school. Julia had been dating a boy. Nothing foreshadowed trouble, and the girl was in full confidence that soon they would get married. Except that the young man suddenly told her that he was tired of their relationship, that he was stuffy, bored, just bored. The guy wanted to make up for lost time to meet with different girls to go out with friends nights away. It turns out that he felt deprived of all this because he had been dating her since ninth grade. For the girl, it was a blow. She worried, looked for faults in herself that weren't there, and blamed herself. In the end, someone advised the girl to consult a psychologist. Counseling specialists cost not cheap, they were not affordable to the student, but Peter was a novice psychologist so his rate quite satisfied the client. So they met. Peter realized that it was unprofessional but could not help himself. A pretty girl somehow immediately captivated his heart. He felt more confident and stronger with her than with Barbara. She had long been the unspoken leader of their couple in all matters. Besides, she had no time for him now, and he was tired of feeling not even second, but fifth or sixth place. Julia needed him so much, listened to him so attentively, and she really felt better talking to him. In general, it was not difficult at all to make the young beauty feel at ease. Soon they moved their meetings offline. Their conversations resembled not the communication of a psychologist and a client, but a friendly chat. Then friendship naturally grew into something more, and they both needed it to feel needed, loved, exceptional. Soon already the girl moved in with him. The man did not want to live a lie, so he honestly told Barbara about everything. Barbara's lips trembled, red spots appeared on her cheeks. But she quickly pulled herself together, as she always did. Well, she said, shaking her head, this is unexpected news. Well, if that's what you've decided, I won't make a scene. We're both adults and independent. Good luck with your new relationship. And Barbara disconnected. It was just like that, no hard feelings, no accusations, no attempts to find out the details. It only confirmed his opinion that Barbara had cooled off on him. Even after the breakup, he continued to think about her. Even though he was happy with Julia, she seemed soft, malleable, pliable, like warm wax. She had grown up in a small provincial town. Her family still lived there, so she had a somewhat patriarchal Morris, a traditional upbringing, and that was its own charm. Although as a psychologist, the guy realized that many of her attitudes needed to be worked out. She studied economics and lived in a dormitory before she moved in with the guy. Her parents were not rich, so she could only rely on herself. And she tried to study hard, because she wanted to get an education. Before she met the psychologist, her studies had been her first priority. But she fell in love, lost her head, and therefore put everything on the back burner her friends, lectures, exams, part-time work. The guy, of course, very flattered. In turn, he tried to do something for her, work more to buy her gifts, take the girl to restaurants and cafes, took on some of the household duties, which pleasantly surprised not used to such behavior of men young lady. He bathed in love and admiration, enjoyed care and warmth. He had never felt so loved the girl actually put him on a pedestal. Sometimes he had jealous thoughts I wonder if she behaved the same way with her ex. Somehow it seemed that yes, caring and helpfulness were inherent traits of this girl's personality. And yet he thought of Barbara. Such an interesting communication on equal terms with his new love did not work out. The girl often did not understand his jokes and almost never knew the authors or those movies about which Peter told her, and the man at such moments caught himself thinking he still lacked Barbara, her wit, insight, directness. 
and then Julia announced that she was expecting a child. This was unexpected and untimely news she was still a student, and he did not earn enough to support his family. He is just developing. He plans to study, gain new experience and knowledge. But if there is a baby, the development can be put on the cross, because training does not imply large earnings, and the family needs to feed. Peter very cautiously suggested that she abort the pregnancy. It seemed to him that this was the best solution to all problems. The girl took offense at him for the first time, first time, first yelled at him, which she had never done before, and then cried. It was hard for him to look at her in such a state. He felt so sorry for the young girl, who, of course, was also shocked by the news of the pregnancy. Well, you hear, Peter put his arm around her shoulders. Everything will be fine. We'll be fine. You're not going to leave me. You're not going to leave us now, are you? No. Peter held the girl even tighter to him. It's a good thing she couldn't see the look on his face. Confused, upset. He didn't want this baby. He didn't want it at all. No. He saw himself as a father in the future, maybe even a father of many children. But it was too soon to start a family. He lived in a rented apartment, worked at a low-paying job he didn't like, and he was just starting out as a psychologist. Yes, she was beautiful, tender, caring, but the guy did not think about tying his life with her. It was a pleasant, not burdensome relationship, needed by both of them at the moment they met. The guy felt like he was trapped. Decency and responsibility kept him from leaving his own child behind. The girl came to her senses a little and even began to rejoice in the pregnancy. The psychologist gained additional clients. Now he worked from dawn to dawn. It was necessary to prepare a safety cushion for the birth of the baby. The young people decided to get married without a lavish celebration, although the bride still dreamed of a beautiful white dress and a wedding with guests and contests. She shared this with a slight sadness in her voice. But the girl understood perfectly well they would need the money for the child. There was no need for unnecessary spending in their situation. Peter felt inadequate again. Here, he can't even fulfill his future wife's wish. She's a young girl. Of course she wants to feel like a princess at her own wedding. She got involved with a beggar, so she has to make herself comfortable and endure hardships from the very beginning. Julia was very afraid to tell her parents that she was pregnant. You know, my parents were so happy that I got in. I am the first in the family with higher education. They had such high hopes for me. And now I have to drop out. Why? Can I take a leave of absence during childbirth and then you can finish your studies? No, I have a family now. I know what it's like. It takes up all your time, all your energy. School's gonna have to wait. And that's why I'm afraid to tell my parents. But you have to tell them. And it's best not to wait. She decided to go home on New Year's Eve. The guy offered to accompany her to support her in a difficult situation. And with the parents of the bride, probably still need to get acquainted. The man was sure he will find the right words to calm the overbearing father and her mother, not without reason he works as a psychologist. But the girl had other plans. No, I'd rather go there myself the first time. You don't know my dad. He can say unpleasant things to you in the heat of the moment. Peter was relieved that it was up to him to offer. She said no. Well, she knows what's right. Let her really talk to her own people, prepare the ground. Julia left and disappeared. She didn't answer her phone. Must have been a bad connection in her small hometown. Julia only managed to call from the train station to say she'd arrived, and that was it. Peter wasn't worried. Why would he be? Julia had come home to her family after all. Maybe parents and will not be delighted that the daughter student will soon give them grandchildren, but they will not kill her, grumble and accept the situation. Especially since the baby's father isn't giving up on the baby and they have a wedding coming up. Peter was enjoying the solitude. Turns out he was a little tired of the girl. At some time in his life, she became a salvation for him, pulled him out of the abyss of anxious thoughts, surrounded him with warmth, inspired him. But now her care and helpfulness irritated him as did her obsessive attention almost constantly, and much more. When the girl did not arrive on the agreed day, he still worried. The girl began lectures, preparation for the session. She could not miss all this without a good reason. The girl's phone was still stubbornly silent, and then the guy went to the university, where Julia studied. Found her group, talked to a few people. They were not aware of what had happened. When Peter had given up hope, 
a girl caught up with him in the hallway. Are you looking for Julia? Yes, you are, Peter, aren't you? He nodded slowly. I'm Jane, her girlfriend. We're from the same town. She asked me to look you up, and here you are. That's lucky. What about her? Why didn't she come back, do you know? Oh, it's a story. It's a nightmare. Her parents, you know, they're very strict. She's their pride, the smartest, most promising kid in the family. They were so happy that their daughter got in, bragged to everyone in town, thought she'd become a successful economist, and then you and all the plans fell apart. When the father found out about his daughter's plans, he was furious, pregnant out of wedlock, soon to be married. She was going to drop out of school too. She was going to become a good wife, an ideal mother, a housewife, instead of conquering career heights. In general, a strict parent decided no wedding and similar tricks, personally escorted his daughter to the clinic, where the head doctor was his former classmate. Even before New Year's Eve, the girl had an operation solved, according to her parents, all the problems so that the problems, so that the child is no more. Peter exclaimed when he heard that. He saw with what joy the girl was waiting for the baby and could imagine in what condition she was now. And anyway, what kind of wildness is this? The girl is of age, she has the right to decide for herself. And what about him? His opinion was not asked at all. That's the way it is with us, Jane shrugged. We're used to listening to our parents. There's no other way. And she didn't go against her mother's and father's wishes either. She told you not to look for her and not to try to find out for yourself. Julia will now study by correspondence from home under parental supervision so that nothing like this happens again. That's all she asked me to tell you. Well, almost. Jane hesitated, clearly uncomfortable being the messenger of bad news. She also said that your relationship was a mistake, but she also wished you happiness in your personal life. Thank you, her too. Peter shook his head and walked towards the university exit. Later at home, he thought over the whole situation and came to the conclusion that everything had happened for the best. The guy didn't feel bitter about the loss. He did not even feel upset. On the contrary, there was joy because everything was solved by itself, without his participation. There will be no family and child and it's not his fault. Julia, of course it's a shame. Such overbearing parents not to be envied. On the other hand, it's her choice. She could have gone against her father if she wanted to, because she knew that her beloved would accept her, would not give her an offense, and yet she gave up the child and the man she loved. That's all right. Life went its way. Suddenly, the activity as a psychologist began to bear fruit, and very even generous. Soon Peter left the hated work in the office and gave himself completely to psychology. In relationships, he was now more cautious. Romances did happen, but the man did not allow any mental intimacy, and even less the appearance of thoughts of children, family, and so on. He did not want it all yet. Or maybe the women were not the right ones. All of them the man involuntarily compared with Barbara, and each time the comparison was not in favor of another companion. They didn't measure up to the queen, not at all. Peter seemed to feel quite happy and accomplished. Favorite high-paying job, his own apartment, a beautiful car. And yet, something was missing. And then fate again brought him together with the one he had not stopped thinking about all this time. By that time, Peter was already quite a successful and established man. He consulted people online from all over the country. There was even a waiting list for his sessions. Retag services were already expensive. The man periodically published books that sold out like hotcakes. The addition he illustrated himself. Thus, another of his talents artistic was realized. To the profession of psychologist added a part-time job digital artist. He had to take a couple of courses to hone his skills, and now he was quite in demand as an illustrator as well. He lived in his own beautiful and stylish apartment, drove an expensive car, had savings and, in general, was rightly considered quite a well-off man in his thirties. Many people of his age had never dreamed of such a thing. Peter, going to the bar that night, had not expected this meeting at all. He generally thought that Barbara had been living somewhere in Moscow for a long time. She disappeared from social networks, so he could not follow her fate as before, but he thought that with her ambitions in a small town there was nothing to do. This city was too small for a queen. However, she was sitting at the bar with her foot on the leg. She was grown up, one if even prettier, well-groomed, stylishly and expensively, but at the same time not flashy, impeccable taste. The same regal posture, the same fathomless, penetrating eyes, 
seeming completely black in the semi-darkness of the bar, and the hair, shiny black hair flowing down her back. She usually wore her hair shorter. It was the first time the man had seen her like this, and it suited her very well. The girl was here with her friends. They were sitting at the counter, as there were no free tables, discussing something lively, laughing. Peter felt numb. At first, he even wanted to leave the bar, to run away, because if they met, they would have to talk about something, and the guy still felt guilty that he was the reason for their breakup. His infidelity was to blame, to be honest. And there was resentment, too Barbara hadn't even tried to find out then, so she was already completely indifferent to him. Maybe she had even met someone there, in a distant country. But he soon realized that he was not afraid of meeting Barbara. On the contrary, he was attracted to her, drawn to her like a magnet, just like when he was young. The man couldn't take his eyes off her. Each of her movements, each feature of her appearance, everything caused complete acceptance. Everything was almost native, his own. She seemed to feel his gaze, turned around. Their eyes met, and Barbara smiled at him without a shadow of resentment, without a shadow of contempt. Peter rose from his seat and moved toward her. They talked all night until morning, retiring to the far end of the bar, where the music was quieter, to enjoy each other's company. And they talked and talked and talked. Barbara talked about her life abroad. It wasn't easy for her, studying from morning till night, not having a settled life. What admirers? She didn't even think of having an affair. Simply no strength or time for it was not purely physically. So the speculation about other men turned out to be false. When you told me we were breaking up, it threw me off my game for a long time. I even thought about dropping out of school, but then of course I pulled myself together. Peter looked into the woman's eyes and understood, felt how hard and sad it was for her then. The guilt was overwhelming him more and more. Well, I got what I deserved for my deed, he sighed. Not for nothing they say about the boomerang of fate. And the man told about his situation with Julia. He didn't forget to mention that all these years he had only thought about her and regretted, desperately regretted their breakup, which was initiated by himself. I felt I was not up to you. I thought you needed someone stronger and more successful. And now, what do you think now? Are you worthy of me now? That question made the man hot. He knew Barbara was asking for a reason. Really? Was there even a one in a million chance that something would happen between them? Maybe. Right now I'm perfectly capable of handling a gorgeous woman like you, he said jokingly, but his eyes were serious. Barbara smiled and kissed him herself. That's how they ended up together again. Both of them had already reached certain career heights. Peter was a sought-after psychologist and Barbara ran a chain of attires. They decided to buy a house and chose a cottage in a well-appointed village near the city. It seemed to both of them that it was a better place to raise their children. They already felt quite ready for parenthood. The age is quite solid, the material base is created. What's the use of procrastinating? They started planning for heirs at the stage of preparation for the wedding. Both went through doctors. The man turned out to be absolutely healthy and she had problems. It's a pity we didn't have time to become mothers earlier. The doctor shook his head. Five or six years ago, everything would have been much easier, but your problems have progressed over the years and now there is little chance. Barbara was upset, of course, but as always, she quickly pulled herself together. She was used to challenges, used to fighting, and she thought she would win this time too. That was the way it had always been. The man supported his beloved in everything, accompanied her to medical procedures, together with her looking for information about her disease and sought advice from the best doctors. Years went by, and the desired pregnancy never came. Iron unbending lady sometimes cried from powerlessness. She really wanted a child, Peter, too. He was ready to give up heirs, only if his wife was happy. Ritega was frightened by this, became uncomfortable with his wife's confusion. In a man's world, this could not be. She is strong. She never cries. She always knows what to do. He tried his best to calm his wife. When the doctors gave an unequivocal verdict, pregnancy is basically impossible. Unless a miracle happens, they had a serious conversation. This has to stop. Stop torturing yourself. All these attempts, they are bad for your health and morale. Stop torturing yourself. Many people live without children and in their own pleasure. That's normal too. Don't you want a child, your own son or daughter? 
I want, of course, like any other person, to continue the species. It's an innate instinct, you know, but not at such a cost. Even more, I want to live happily, and I want you, my wife, to be happy too. That's my dream. Perhaps it's time for us to accept the situation, to free ourselves from unfulfilled hopes and live in peace. We can do it. I definitely want a baby. You're a man. You probably wouldn't understand. But if this is the way things are, what can we do? You just have to accept it. I'll help you. I've got the right techniques, so. No, the woman said firmly. There are other ways to become parents. I've been looking at orphanage websites lately. You can't imagine how many of them there are now orphans, some of them left in the maternity hospital, some of them later deprived of their parents. There's one boy, he's... No, the man responded immediately, that's right. There are no orphans. The man understood perfectly well what his wife was getting at a foster child from who knows where. Retag had a prejudice against adoption. His neighbors, Sergio and Mary, are good people, kind and smiling. They were always attentive to the local children and gave them candy and let them play with their dog and even took a sincere interest in the affairs of the neighbor children. It was especially pleasant, by the way. But they had no children of their own. Other neighbors often sighed about it, but God didn't give them any. Too bad. And then they had a baby after all, a chubby-cheeked baby boy. Peter was surprised. He already understood then that at first children are very small they can neither walk nor talk, they are carried in a stroller. But here it was just like that. Mary herself explained to the local kids that Paul was a boy from the orphanage. That's how it happens when kids are left without parents, and some are lucky enough to be taken into a family. Peter was very happy for Paul. He was very lucky indeed. Sergio and Mary are the best parents you can only dream of such parents. The boys took Paul under their patronage. The girls socialized with him. The boys took him to their games. And at first everyone seemed to like Paul. And then the kid began to grow up and began to manifest in him qualities that at first simply caused rejection and then grew into something terrible, ugly, unimaginable. Simply put, he became a monster. In first grade, the boy started smoking. That's when he was first caught stealing. Paul did not want to sit quietly at lessons, beat and called children names, walked around the classroom instead of sitting at the desk. The teacher could not do anything with him. Paul swore, although his parents were intelligent people. His foster mother and father did not think he was worth anything. Peter still remembered how his parents ran around the yard at night in search of their misbehaving son. The neighborhood boys helped them. And then there's more. Paul got mixed up with a bad crowd. He skipped school. He smoked. He even started drinking when he was only a fifth grader. Adults often discussed the situation and all agreed that it was his genes. The unfortunate neighbors were presented in neighborhood conversations as innocent martyrs who had shouldered such a burden for nothing. They were really good parents. They loved the boy, practiced a lot with him. Even then, Peter realized that blood is not water and that even the most correct upbringing cannot always correct the code which was written by nature for generations. Paul soon ended up in a juvenile prison because he maimed someone in a street fight. After that, the neighbors bought a tiny and old house somewhere on the outskirts of town and moved away. So Peter didn't know what happened to their family next. But he assumed that nothing good could be there anymore. No, he didn't agree to such a thing categorically. His wife did not fully accept his choice. His wife periodically tried to change his mind, gave seemingly reasonable arguments, told about positive examples, but he was adamant. He did not want them to turn from happy beautiful and healthy people into the likeness of Sergio and Mary, became the same thin, pale and restrained. Well, no. The wife seemed to settle down over time. She found her purpose in other things. The woman now traveled to orphanages and helped the unfortunate, destitute children. It was charity. In one orphanage, she set up a playroom and in another a yard with swings and slides. Barbara found out what problems there were in this or that institution and solved them. Somewhere there were not enough nannies, somewhere the roof was leaking. Somewhere the pupils were wearing old, no longer fashionable clothes. Barbara not only covered the primary needs of orphanages, but also did something more. She founded circles and sections right in the orphanages so that orphans could find themselves, show their talents, organized fancy holidays for children, and found like-minded people. The woman felt almost happy. She had no children of her own, but she gave joy and warmth to thousands of destitute children 
Even the newspapers wrote about her activities, filmed videos. The man was happy for his wife. Finally, she found herself, realized her maternal instinct in such an interesting way. It was good for everyone. The man himself sometimes took part in the actions. He called his wife nothing but a good fairy. Barbara laughed and said that she liked the former title of queen better. Peter thought that his life was now predetermined for many years to come, but fate again threw him a test, which he again failed miserably. One of his assistants, who served as his secretary, was a young, dazzlingly beautiful woman who looked like a photo model from a glossy magazine. Peter himself didn't realize how it happened. He and his team were celebrating another successful project in a restaurant. His wife was not present. She had just left for another city on business. Sarah asked the chief to dance. Peter saw her huge mermaid eyes for the first time. Peter couldn't resist. How is it even possible to be sympathized with such a beautiful woman? They went to Saraline's rented apartment and spent the night there. In the morning, he did not regret anything, strangely enough. On the contrary, he felt happy next to a beautiful woman. Anyway, they became lovers. Sarah was just perfect, beautiful, not demanding, passionate. She realized that their relationship is a secret and did not seem to claim anything at first and then began to talk about love, the development of their affair and even about divorce. Peter didn't understand himself. He was physically attracted to Sarah. He was crazy about her green eyes and slightly husky voice, her smell, her blonde hair. But Barbara was her own person in spirit. The man, being a psychologist, couldn't make sense of himself. Was it really possible? He fell in love with two women at once. All in all, difficult times had come for Retag. Now he felt guilty in front of both of them as lawful wedded wife and his wife. A decision had to be made. But how to do it, so that he would not regret it? And then Sagalapina pulled a trump card out of her sleeve. Just think I'll give you a child our own. Barbara won't be able to do that. But me. Peter thought about it. Indeed, with Sagalinina they could have a strong, full-fledged family. But it would be hard to leave Barbara too. She is already dear, own, faithful, reliable. To betray her again. And yet the decision is ripe. He chose the secretary. At the same time with Barbara planned to remain in friendly relations. But the man did not dare to voice his decision to his wife. The mistress pressed, hurried. She could be understood. She wanted certainty. But he was still slow. And again, for the umpteenth time, fate intervened. Something happened that he never expected. One day his wife said they needed to have a serious talk. The conversation took place in the evening in the living room of a house too spacious for a family of two. Peter was nervous. It seemed to him that Barbara had found out everything about him and was about to ask him uncomfortable questions. On the one hand, that would be even better. At least things would finally be resolved. On the other hand, I wanted to present the situation in a different way. I have some bad news for you, his wife began. Peter tensed up. Here it comes. Only further wife told such a story that worries about the disclosure of the affair seem to be nonsense. I am ill and very seriously. I've been diagnosed with an incurable blood disease. I only found out recently. It took a long time to get a diagnosis. Why? Why didn't I tell you before? She grinned. I just didn't want to worry you before. I thought it was just a vitamin deficiency or something. And then I got this terrible diagnosis. Is there really no cure? It's the 21st century. He didn't want to believe what his wife was saying. It seemed that anything could be cured nowadays, if only there was money. And luckily they had the money. Barbara shook her head sadly. She put her hands on the man's shoulders. She's comforting him too in this state. It's amazing. I don't believe, I don't believe you can't be helped. We're going to fight. Peter was going to leave his wife but he didn't want to lose her like this, for good, permanently. Barbara meant a lot to him. She was his own person, dear and beloved. He wouldn't give her up to some disease, no way. Do you remember years ago when you said we had to accept the fact that we weren't going to have children? Accept the situation. That's what I'm saying now. We just have to accept it. He shook his head no, it wasn't the same. And again the tests, the clinics, the consultations with medical luminaries from all over the world. Only now the fight was not for the dream of parenthood, but for life. The man was not going to give up. He studied a lot of information about his wife's disease, now better understood the situation. 
Yes, the disease really turned out to be very insidious and dangerous. Most patients after diagnosis died within a year. But there were exceptions, cases of miraculous healing, and Peter hoped for that. Of course, he didn't say anything about the mistress. It was not enough to kill a man in such a state with bad news. Sarah agreed with Retag's decision. She said she was willing to wait until the situation was resolved one way or another. She even supported him, saw how hard it was for him, understood perfectly well that his wife meant a lot to him, but she was not jealous. A perfect life companion. Barbara was getting worse and worse, despite intensive treatment, and she was slowly fading away. Her husband was caring for her on his own. It was clear that these were her last days. It was hard to realize that the fight was lost. The man was still unable to come to terms with it, but the patient seemed to accept the situation and even calmed down. The woman quite consciously enjoyed every day, realizing that there was not much left. She met with friends, visited beautiful and favorite places while she had strength. The man tried to accompany his wife everywhere, but he had a job and the secretary needed some attention. However, Barbara sometimes asked him to leave her alone. They talked a lot during this period. I am grateful to fate that I have such a man as you in my life, the woman smiled. You always understood me like no one else, felt my soul. It is worth a lot. The man smiled, squeezed his wife's hand and felt guilty again. It's good that she doesn't know about Seraline after all. What a blessing that he didn't have time to reveal his cards in front of his wife. All that's needed is a negative experience at such a difficult time. I think about it sometimes too. What a blessing that we finally met. He answered quite sincerely, you are a unique person the closest to me. And these words too, paradoxically, were pure truth. He understood perfectly well that he was losing a dear person, a close friend, and a warmer and deeper relationship in his life will not be. She left at dawn in her sleep, quietly and calmly, an easy end as many people said afterwards. A nurse slept in the room with her, her frightened scream was what woke Retag, and he immediately understood everything. The ambulance, the police, filling out some paperwork, preparing to say goodbye. Everything was happening in a fog. He couldn't accept the fact that Barbara was gone. Not at all, not anywhere. Where could it all suddenly disappear to? Her sharp mind, her love of children, her determination, her courage. How could this be possible? Retega stood by her in this difficult moment. She honestly tried to reassure the man but she had never felt him as subtly as Barbara. She said things that hurt the man even more. It's all for the best. At least she didn't have any pain now. In fact, the situation resolved itself. You didn't even have to say anything. Peter shook his head. How can losing someone like that be for the best? She just doesn't understand anything. There were even such words, think about it. You will get everything now you had no children, so you are the only heir. And in a divorce, Everything would have to be divided in half. The man looked at her in such a way that she immediately realized what a terrible foolishness she had said. The girl tried to remedy the situation. Well, I mean, she got sick anyway. It would have happened anyway. And here's such a benefit. Just shut up, the widower asked. People came to say goodbye. Lots of people, colleagues and friends, and also those whom she had helped for many years. They came up to the man, expressed their condolences, said good words about his wife, and Peter was proud of her. He was proud of his wonderful wife. He was desperately sorry that he too rarely told her how wonderful she was, and yet he was glad that sometimes he did. A few days had passed since Barbara had left when he received a phone call from a woman who introduced herself as a notary and made an appointment to read the will. Peter was surprised. He didn't know that his wife had made a will. Probably she decided to make it easier for him to receive the inheritance. She had taken care of everything. And now Peter sat in the kitchen and smoked out the window. It was early morning. Sarah was still asleep and he was suffering from insomnia, unfortunately. He wanted to go to sleep and see Barbara, maybe even talk to her. The man sighed and put the kettle on he should drink coffee, strong, hot, black. Maybe it would cheer him up a little because his head was so heavy. Peter poured the steaming coffee into a cup, sat down at the table again and thought. He remembered Barbara, their life, her dreams and plans and desires. Yeah, the world had lost a lot of things. She had done so much good for people, for underprivileged children. Barbara was even seriously afraid to hear from the notary that the woman had bequeathed all her money to some orphanage or children's home. He was distracted from his thoughts by his mistress. 
She flew into the kitchen, anxious, disheveled, but still unrealistically beautiful. We're late, she said, her voice trembling with excitement. I overslept, and you don't know why you're sitting here. Peter, as if out of a daze, took a sip of long, cooled coffee and began to pack. They still managed to get there in time and arrived at the office when the meeting with the notary was still five minutes away. It was lucky no traffic, no accidents on the way. His companion looked luxurious, even too luxurious for such an occasion. Tight, dark gray dress emphasized the graceful curves of her figure. Light blonde hair flowed beautifully over her fragile shoulders. But now Retag was not interested in admiring his companion. He wanted to go back about five years when these two important women were not around. The girl turned around on the porch and, trying to hide her irritation, turned to him. He grinned. He understood his mistress was eager to know what he had inherited from Barbara. As they entered the notary's office, an old woman dressed very modestly, even poorly, hurried in. What to say, she looked like a beggar. And a girl, a lovely, charming girl, about ten years old. Wavy, blonde hair, big gray eyes. Peter looked at her and couldn't understand. This child reminded him of someone. Just who? Could it be a relative of the deceased? Maybe he had met this little girl once before. Just in case, the man politely and kindly said hello to both the grandmother and her granddaughter. The old woman answered cautiously, somehow wary or averse. But the girl smiled broadly, which made his soul immediately lighten. She looked at the old woman and the girl as if they were nasty spiders in a jar. She obviously hadn't expected to see them here. Have a seat, smiled the notary, dressed in an elegant pantsuit. Everyone present followed her advice. I thought only the deceased's loved ones would be here. She raised her thin eyebrows and said, those who appear in the will. That's right, the notary nodded. Segalinina's eyebrows rose even higher in surprise or indignation, and she gave the old woman and the girl another scornful glance. Are we expecting someone else? Sahalinina asked, putting her foot on her leg. No, everyone is here now. The notary behaved professionally and did not react to the negativity of the capricious visitor. She stood up, expressed her condolences, said a few warm words about Barbara, and then took out of a large envelope a double-folded sheet of paper, both sides written in neat handwriting. This letter is for you. The notary handed the sheet to the man. You can read it here. Here the deceased explains everything to you. He clutched the letter with both hands. He couldn't wait to be alone to read the last message of his beloved. There was no doubt in his mind that something very important was written there. After that, the notary began to read out the will aloud, as was customary. As expected, a considerable amount of money was given to the foundation, which was engaged in the support of orphans. The mistress wrinkled her nose when she heard the size of the transfer. But the husband got all the real estate, cars, and even business. The man, however, had no idea what he should do with a network of attires. He never really got into his wife's business, but it seemed that this business was already quite a well-oiled mechanism It worked like clockwork by itself. Barbara had managed to set up the firm in such a way that everything functioned without her direct participation and control. And then the notary said something that made Salini in a jump. The deceased had bequeathed a large sum of money to a girl named Eva, the same girl who was sitting across from her grandmother. Eva didn't even pay attention to the amount. She was too young to realize how much money it was. But the old woman realized everything. She shuddered, turned pale, then even blushed. An obliging female notary immediately offered the agitated visitor a glass of water. Who are these people? Indignant. We don't know them. Are they her relatives? They're obviously not first cousins. Otherwise, the deceased's husband would have known them. What's going on? Is this all done by law? Legally confirmed the notary. It's the will of the deceased. A person can name whoever they want in the will. It doesn't have to be relatives. Who are you? I've already addressed the old lady directly. Scammers, don't get your hopes up, you'll get nothing. I'll prove that she was incapacitated when she signed the will. She's a sick person. And you must have taken advantage of her condition. She looked at her. Not with fright, no, more with disappointment. The man noticed that at the beginning of the meeting the girl had admired her. Of course, such a beauty, just a photo model. But now, now the idol was turning into a monster before his eyes. Calm down. Irritatedly threw over his shoulder the man. 
He himself was not surprised by this outcome. The man realized that his spouse would definitely let some of what she had accumulated during her life go to charity. The girl and the grandmother are obviously very poor. Surely his wife wanted to help them. But why them? And with such a large sum of money? Excuse me, I'm not protesting in any way, he said to the old woman. If my wife has decided so, then it's right. But I'm just curious. How did you meet Barbara? Why did she choose you? The old woman looked him carefully in the eyes. Read the letter and you'll understand. EVA, we have to go. The girl slipped off the chair with relief. What was happening was clearly beginning to strain her. Let's read the letter, she demanded as the door slammed shut behind her. At least we'll know who they are. You see, I must read it in private. She raised her lips resentfully, but remained silent. Peter sat in an old coffee shop he'd frequented as a student. He had chosen the farthest table against the wall behind the racks and plants. It was quiet, peaceful, cozy, and lonely. There was no better place to finally read a letter. It was not so easy to get rid of the mistress. She wanted to be with him when he began to read the letter. He even had to raise his voice at her. And now here he was, alone with the letter. Her heart was pounding so hard it felt like it was going to jump out of her chest. I wonder what his beloved wanted to tell him. Well, hello, Peter. If you're reading this letter, it means, unfortunately, I'm gone. It's a shame, of course. Life is a good thing. Anyway, it's all happened now. So it's time for you to find out about everything. I love you. You know you love me, too. I'm sure of that, despite your occasional flings. By the way, I know about Sarah. I wish I could have seen her face when she heard how much money I bequeathed to Evie. It must have been fun, Dot. He shuddered. So she knew everything. What a nightmare and he had made such an effort not to upset his wife. All the energy that should have gone into fighting the disease. Don't think I don't take offense because of Sarah. I understand everything. You're the kind of person who can't live his whole life with one woman. A creative person who needs inspiration. Amused out Peter thought, wow. His wife understood him better than he understood himself. She is just such a muse. But I never doubted that you loved me, really. You were there for me during a difficult time in my life. Supportive, caring, that's priceless. I wasn't so scared with you. You fought so fiercely for me when I already realized that that was it, when I had resigned myself to it. But you didn't give up until the end. You have no idea what it all meant to me. Thank you for that. And know that you are my nearest and dearest person, Dot. The man felt tears come to his eyes. The sharp pain of losing Barbara pierced his heart again. Yes, he felt the same way. She had been a close and kindred spirit to him. They were more than just husband and wife soul mates, kindred spirits. He was willing to move mountains for her, and she would do the same for him. Now let's talk about Evie. Wonderful girl, isn't she? You've probably seen her already. She's so sweet. Doesn't she remind you of anyone? She's like someone who's not a stranger to both of us. I met her a long time ago. Three years ago. She was just a little girl then. You know, I was helping orphanages. She's an orphan too. But at least she has a great-grandmother. But she and her grandmother live very poorly. And at that time the situation became so difficult that the old lady had to give her granddaughter to an orphanage. It was hard for both of them, but in the orphanage the girl was fed and clothed, but great-grandmother could not always do it. I saw her at a New Year's Eve performance. The children had prepared a big concert. The girl's great-grandmother was in the hall. She, by the way, cried without ceasing, blotting her eyes with a handkerchief. A sad sight. The girl attracted my attention first by her appearance. The little beauty reminded me of someone, only I did not immediately realize who. Have you finally figured it out, or not yet? I asked the teachers about the fate of the little girl and was horrified. Seven-year-old girl had to go through something that not every adult can withstand. At first she had everything to be happy. She lived in a small town with her mother, grandmother, and grandfather. True, there was no daddy in the family, but this is not uncommon today. It's true that many children grow up without fathers. There is nothing surprising in this. Eva was everyone's favorite. The young mother was very fond of her. It was said that she gave birth to a girl from a very favorite man, and he abandoned them, did not want to become a father afraid. It's good that mom had good parents. Of course, they did not abandon their daughter in a difficult situation and accepted, supported, and when she gave birth, 
very helpful to the young mother with a baby girl. They lived like that, and the four of them grandmother was engaged in the household, grandfather earned money to feed the family, and the mother finished her university studies by correspondence, because now she had a baby in her arms. The girl grew up a healthy and obedient child. About such people say gift children, her mother simply adored her. Grandmother and grandfather in her soul did not dote. There was no extra money in the family, but adults spoiled her as much as possible. Her mother had a dream to go to the sea with her daughter, to show the little girl the high waves, walk with her along the coast, breathe fresh sea air. When the girl grew up a little, the grandfather decided to fulfill the wish of his daughter and granddaughter. He bought up some money and planned a trip to the sea in the family car. It was cheaper that way. She was only four years old at the time. At first, everything was going just fine. The family had a wonderful vacation at the seaside. All their dreams came true walks along the shore, a southern tan, and beautiful bright pictures. But on the way back on the way home on the highway, there was a terrible accident. The car lost control and went into a ditch. Later, the cause was determined it turned out that grandfather had a heart attack right behind the wheel. A long trip, heat, plenty of impressions, a sudden change of climate. A lot of factors came together. That's the result. The driver himself was almost unhurt, but he was not taken to the hospital. The cause of death was that very heart attack. His wife died on the spot from her injuries. His daughter, Eva's mother, she was taken to the hospital, but the condition of the young woman was very serious. She was placed in intensive care. And what happened to the youngest passenger? It's a miracle she survived. Just a couple of abrasions, a fright, but not a minor fright. The girl cried out at night for a long time and often dreamed about this terrible accident. The little girl was taken to her only close relative great-grandmother. She lost her son-in-law and daughter in the accident. The little girl's mother was in a serious condition, but there was still hope for her salvation. Home for treatment required money, and a lot of it. So the old lady had to sell the apartment where the happy family lived. The treatment didn't work. The mother was not saved. The girl was left an orphan. She had no one but an old great-grandmother. No, there was a father somewhere, but how to find him? The old woman did not know the details of her granddaughter's history. She had no idea where her father might be. And does he need a daughter, if he has already abandoned her? There was nothing to do. Great-grandmother began to raise her little granddaughter alone. It was hard. It's not easy to keep up with a small child at such a respectable age. Great-grandmother's pension was miserable. Her health was also poor. She couldn't get a part-time job. There was also an allowance to formalize and confirm it had to be every year, and it cost the old woman a lot of work. So many papers to collect, so many offices to run through. But the old woman tried, ran, collected so that her great-granddaughter had at least this minimum allowance. And somehow the old woman and the girl lived poorly, saving money on everything, already suffering, but they kept afloat. And then it was time to go to school. The family budget couldn't bear the new expenses. My great-grandmother did her best to get her great-granddaughter to school, even going into debt. And after that there were very bad times when even bread was not enough every day. So great-grandmother made the decision and put the girl in an orphanage, temporarily due to the difficult financial situation. And then that concert, the stage, I saw her, I was hooked by her looks, and it spun. She looks a lot like you. Did you notice that? Same eyes, same look, same spread. Check it out, and the mole on her cheek. Even the mole is exactly the same. I looked at the girl and realized that coincidences like that just don't happen. And then it turned out that it really wasn't a coincidence dot. Peter tore himself away from the letter. How had he not guessed it at once? Evia really looked like him. It was not without reason that the girl seemed familiar to him. He saw almost the same features in the mirror every day. I dug deeper. I even had to hire detectives. And I found out. Anyway, just don't fall off your chair. Or whatever you're sitting on right now, that's your daughter. I purposely withheld her mother's name before, or you'd have guessed right away. And I like to keep things intriguing. You know it's more interesting that way. That's what my great-grandmother told me, that you left Julia pregnant. Scared, didn't want to be a father, didn't want to take responsibility. I immediately thought there was something wrong. So of course I dug deeper again. I found out that you wanted to get married, but the wedding didn't happen. Why? 
I tracked down her best friend. She told me. The girl's father was against the wedding. He did send his daughter to the hospital, but it turned out she couldn't do anything. All the deadlines had passed. She seemed to love you very much and begged her parents to let her become your wife. Especially since you had already filed an application, but her father was adamant. He thought that, being a wife and mother, his daughter will certainly not finish university, and decided so the daughter gives birth, lives with her parents, they help with the baby, and she finishes her studies, builds a career, and then does what she wants. But the accident happened soon after she got her diploma. Who knows, maybe if she'd stayed alive, she would have found you sooner. She probably would have. Well, Eva's great-grandmother was simply unaware of who the girl's father was, so she couldn't find you if she wanted to. That's the story. If it hadn't been for chance, the girl would still be fatherless. Now I hope you understand why I left her such a large inheritance. She's your daughter. I had to help that girl. It wasn't just money, I hope. I think I gave something much more valuable finding a father for the girl. I know how you long for a child, a baby of your own. And here you have a ready-made daughter, all grown up. Interesting with her own opinions and personality. She's wonderful, and she needs you very, very much. And you need her. Just do me a favor, don't make Saraline the girl's stepmother. She'll make her life a nightmare. Find someone else who's more empathetic and understanding. You deserve better than that. And so does EVA. I believe that you are the closest people. You will reunite and live happily ever after. I wish I could be there for you. I love you and kiss you. Take care of each other, Dot. Peter, who had finished reading, only then noticed that his hands were trembling. As a postscript, the wife had left the address of the girl and a link to a DNA test, which as it turned out, this amazing woman had managed to conduct secretly from her husband. Peter did not doubt the result of this research. A light, fresh breeze was blowing from the sea. It was too cold for swimming, but walking along the shore in such weather was a pleasure. A man walked along the sand holding his daughter's hand. It was hard to get used to it, but how pleasant it was to say to someone, this is my daughter. They talked a lot, traveled a lot, talked about everything in the world. Peter felt absolutely happy, and he knew very well who he had to thank for this happiness, Barbara. Amazing, unique, intelligent, sensitive, kind. Sometimes it seemed to re-tag that she was somewhere nearby, looking at him and his daughter and smiling contentedly. 